Right. Well, um, at this time it's morning, so I am going to say good morning, you 12. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, so today we're going to go through leisure in Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, now this is quite a, uh, a a long dot point. Okay, so so we we break it up um, in this for leisure activities. Oh, sorry, everyday life as a dot point is a massive dot point. So um, we're going to break that up. So uh, for today uh, we're going to do uh, leisure activities and baths. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. I felt like I talked really fast in that last um, video for you as well, so I'm gonna try and not talk too fast for you this time. Okay. Um, look, in terms of from um, digging, I've been doing about this dot point. Uh, generally speaking, um, what could happen for everyday life as a dot point? Um, you could get all of everyday life, like all of this, as one big extended response okay that could happen um, where you're asked to look at sources and um, or or you could be asked to look at smaller sources and ask do they provide a comprehensive picture of everyday life or you could get asked about the value and limitations of a couple of sources as well about all of everyday life okay um, which obviously ends up as a like a 10 to 15 marker or so um, not only could you get asked about all of everyday life, they could specify smaller breakdowns of this. So it doesn't work in your favor to go, well, I'm going to just kind of learn housing and leisure activities well. I'm not really going to go over the rest because they very well could ask you um, about one of the sub points in everyday life. Okay, so it's very important you do understand all of them. Okay, I've tried to get the main idea of this whole video and PowerPoint into two sentences. Okay, so the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum had a few options for communal and private forms of leisure. Although there were slight variations in their access to these forms of leisure based on their social rank, most people had good access to these forms of entertainment and relaxation, which often played a role in social cohesion and political gain. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you right now, that's okay, because at the end of the video, hopefully you can come back to this point and go, oh yeah, that's what, that's what he means, okay? <clears throat> so, um, we've got a pretty extensive amount of evidence left in Pompeii and Herculaneum about the everyday life of uh, the citizens, okay? Uh, this evidence is made up of wall paintings, mosaics, sculptures, graffiti, and obviously the architectural buildings as well. Okay, so we've got a we've got a fair amount of um, evidence left for us to interpret as to the everyday life of you know Pompeians and Herculaneans. Uh, this these little pieces of information here that they can be quite useful just as even if you were to tuck them away for an introduction. Okay, you're introducing the question. You chuck in some of these kind of general ideas, um, and they're really good to kind of um, uh, uh, impress a marker off the bat with your introduction. Okay. Okay, the theatre. Sorry, I am drinking my cup of tea this morning, so if I pause for a bit, it's to have a sip. Um, so the theatre. Uh, they're not only a form of entertainment, uh, but they're also they're also this opportunity for political display and political gain. Okay, uh, the so um, Emperor Augustus uh, he, he introduced the Lex Julia Theatralis laws, which basically imposed a strict seating plan um, in many forms of entertainment. Um, the idea behind this was to reinforce your place in the theatre and reinforce your place um, in everyday life, okay? Um, and obviously you have your dignitaries and your local politicians and stuff and your important wealthier people um, sitting up the front. Uh, and then you've got, as you move back, you've got, you know, obviously you're decreasing in social rank with women, lowest class, potentially like slaves right up the back, Okay. So, uh, what from what we can see, uh, there's a strong connection to political life. 
um, and and someone would often put on a performance and they would pay for it, um, or they could um, add uh, an extension to the theatre, <clears throat> and that was kind of their way of, you know, that was a way of getting that political favour and, and followers and supporters for themselves. Okay, the entry was um, likely free, but uh, at the theatre there is a token box still there. Um, we, I guess the, the, the token is more for your seating position as opposed to actually being admitted. Um, we also know the theatre was, was, was likely quite, quite lively and noisy. Okay, um, the actors, whilst they could be popular, um, they, they had a quite a low social status, and if you remember... Um, when we spoke about some of the, the prominent social ranks before, you couldn't attain that if you were an actor. So whilst you could be a popular actor, they, they had a quite a low social status. It wasn't really a valued job, uh, like, I guess, from a political perspective. Um, and as you can see, this photo, I, I, I got this from Mrs. Kenner uh, from your trip. Um, very disappointed you are not following the strict seating plan here. Okay, so for evidence, because obviously we, we need to talk about evidence first. Well, not first, sorry, but we need, obviously, knowing the evidence of each of these points is the most important thing, guys. Okay, so I'm really, for everyday life, I'm really going to try and focus on the evidence for you to tuck away. So the first one is the large theatre in Pompeii. Okay, it's roughly set for about 5,000 um, spectators. Roughly, uh, the southwestern section of the city uh, is restored and enlarged in the time of Augustus by Marcus Halconius Seller uh, and at his own expense. Okay, um, there's an inscription left in the stone seating, which which is on the next page. I've got some pictures for you, uh, which which may have actually been reserved for his spot in between the two halves of the inscription. That will make sense in a second. Um, but the the translation basically says. Uh, to Mark, Marcus Halconius Rufus, Dumvi uh, for lawsuits four times, Quin Quinalis elected military tribune by the people, priest of Augustus by decree of town councillors. Okay. Um, statue of Marcus in a niche on the stage signifying his importance. So it was, it wasn't, uh, it was, it was quite common for statues of gods, statues of emperors, statues of local significant politicians to actually be up on the stage of the theatre in the background. So a niche is like a small little like groove or opening in the wall, um, and, and you could have had a statue in there. Okay, remember the quinquinalis is that every five-year um, job for the senior magistrates who updated the citizenship lists. Okay. All right, here are some pictures of our large theatre. Here's our Marcus statue. Here's our inscription where they believe the chair, this special chair, might have gone in here. And we've got that curved, very kind of Greek style um, theatre design. Okay, it's very common for Greek theatres and Roman theatres to be built into a hillside. Um, yeah, into a hillside. Oops, I oh know that's right. Um, look, the, what you're seeing here, the porticus, um, this is an area where um, it actually connected the, the large theatre that we just looked at and the small theatre that we're about to look at. There was actually a connection between the two theatres. And <clears throat> this was a place, um, it was kind of like a quadrangle um, and with a covered walkway. And this is kind of a place where, where you can, you know, wander to buy snacks or um, you, you know, originally you would talk to the other people from their show in the intermission, um, and that kind of stuff. This area was later changed into like a, a gladi gladiatorial, gladiatorial barracks, um, which, which we know from some of the, the shops that are converted to cells and some of the gladiator garb and stuff that's left in there when we find it. So now we're talking about the small theatre, the Odeon, in Pompeii as well. Okay, so as you can see this picture here, this is how close the two theatres are to each other. Okay, with our, you know, quad porticus 
in this area. Okay, um, the the small theater is much smaller. Okay, uh, it's it's for more. Pro it's it's used for more cultural events, more intimate music recitals, poetry or literary readings and stuff like that. So um, it almost I wouldn't say maybe a community center. Probably that's not not the way I look at it. But I guess a similar ish in a way. Like it's almost like a little bit of a you know the public use of libraries that we might use a library for today, um, but as well as very small. Um, music recitals as well and acoustically it would have been quite nice in there um, and again built into a hillside that curved Greek kind of um, architectural design and this would have as well um, followed the seating if you can see actually um, have a look at the seating for the, the you know the upper class or the most important people um, it's really wide and shallow seating would have been nice and comfortable plenty of room and we actually even sorry we actually even have a separation of um, between the most important people and then the rest of the people so there's even like a physical separation there if you can see that okay um, there we go. all right guys Herculaneum theater is a little bit different okay uh, it's between 2,000 to 2,500 for seating. So it's definitely not as big as a large theatre, but it seems bigger than the Odeon, okay? It's in the northeast area of the city. Now, the interesting part about the Herculaneum Theatre, it is, um, it's uncovered, it's unexcavated, okay? So uh, it, it's still underground, okay? Uh, so it was discovered in the 18th century when tunnelling uh, so it's still buried under volcanic rock. Um, this would have been one of the most impressive structures in Herculaneum. And Herculaneum's considerably smaller than Pompeii. So this building is... Uh, Herculaneum, as we know, is a like a kind of a t touristy destination kind of place. And this would have potentially been quite a significant feature of that, of Herculaneum. Okay. The other interesting thing about the theatre, it's not built into the hillside as we see a lot of um, theatres are. It's actually a freestanding theatre, okay? And if that doesn't make sense to you, um, sh there's, a, there's a picture of it on the next page that I'll get to in a second. Um, we find some inscriptions at Herculaneum as well. Uh, we also definitely see the presence of Marcus Nonius Bulbus, okay? Remember the guy I told you not to forget in Herculaneum? He pops up here again, Okay. Um, so we probably would have, we found statues of him, pardon me, I found statues of him in uh, Herculaneum as, what the theatre at Herculaneum as well. Okay, uh, we also got an inscription here, uh, once again, talking about uh, what someone has done out of their own money and the positions they've held. Okay, so again, that, there's a linking here of everyday life and political gain here, guys, okay, so, um, Many of these dot points within Pompeii can be easily, easily connected. Here's some pictures of Hercula the theatre. Here's our entrance. Okay, but this is a model. <clears throat> this is a model of the theatre. Okay, see how it's not built into a hillside, but it's actually a freestanding building in its own right. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Here's a computer. Um, I can zoom in. Here's some computer reconstructions as well. This is what I mean about the niche. See this little hole in the wall, a like groove and opening in the wall? Um, that's what I mean about what a niche is, and that's where the statues could be, and you can see them there. Now, um, these things here, um, you definitely would have had your, um, you know, important people sitting up the front again, absolutely, but we've got two sitting here that we believed are like for honoured guests as well in the Herculaneum Theatre, okay? Okay, so we've got some um, statues of Marcus um, as well as his son. And they're equestrian statues. And basically what that means is um, equestrian statues are, it's a, quite an honoured, um, it's quite an honour to have yourself as a statue on a horse. It's quite a, like a mighty 
kind of look and generally speaking you're in military uniform okay it's quite an honored position to be um, put as a statue on as an equestrian statue okay statues can be quite important pieces of evidence because they can sometimes give us an idea of what um, male elites would have worn Okay. Oh, it's cut out some of my... There we go. Um, other evidence for the theatre. So we've got some mosaics here. Okay, and we find these in um, in some houses and stuff like that, um, which we'll get to housing um, soon. Here's, uh, I think it's the next one actually, mosaic depicting the cast of tragic actors. Okay, we've got a fresco depicting an actor in a mask. Um, we even find a theatre mask in Pompeii. Um, we And we also find graffiti. Okay. Um, so, sorry. I think these two are from a house that is known as the House of the Tragic Poet. Okay. Um, in terms of some graffiti, we find Actius, Master of Stage Performers, Paris, Pearl of the Stage. So, we can... Some of these actors could have been local actors, but we also find that... Um, Sometimes you could get visiting actors from Rome or parts of the country that come around and kind of do some shows that um, actors could really get popular and kind of get their own fan clubs. Um, so these forms of graffiti can tell us about the popularity uh, of, of actors. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So now we get to the amphitheater, or, you know, otherwise known as the arena, but try and, you know, remember it as the amphitheater. As you can see here, well, this is like a sports stadium, so it, it holds a significant amount of people, guys, okay? Um, likely more than, you know, what Pompeii generally had. So it, it's, 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 it's likely that people from visiting towns actually came to Pompeii to go to the, the sports stadium, which is not unlike, you know, you know today people travel all over the place to go to, to a stadium to watch something, okay? Um, so what would have taken place here, things like athletic displays, gladiatory contests, beast hunts, beast hunts and stuff like that. Um, we've got a fairly strong connection between um, kind of funerary, rights and, and gladiatory games. So if someone dies, um, a, a gladiatorial games might be put on, okay? But there's a few reasons. Um, you know, uh, honour of an emperor, military victory and all that kind of stuff, okay? These are very popular as well. Uh, and very often politicians or someone might be paying for these to happen. <clears throat> Again, um, it's kind of bring everyone together, everyone has a good time and it's you, you know, you, you'd throw out there, oh yeah, it was definitely me that paid for this out of my own expense, okay? Um, off of very much um, a lot of Donald Trump's trying to throw out there what they'd done um, and how good they are, okay? Um, you needed permission uh, of an emperor uh, or a local civil authority, so known as a Lenista um, or a special agent to organise the games, okay? Um, again, the seating positions would have been hierarchically based, okay? Uh, sorry about that. I'm getting emails, so there might be a few more of those annoying sounds that come in. So I apologize. So here are some photos of the amphitheater. Okay, it is massive, guys. Okay, and you've got the the strong Miss Kenner, who's holding up the arena by herself, the amphitheater. Okay, um, so these are some inscriptions that are found as well. Okay, dedicatory inscription um, recording the amphitheatre was built at private expense and dedicated in perpetuity to the colonist of Pompeii. Titus Atulius Sela, son of Gaius, Dumvir, instead of games and lights, sort of the construction of a seating sector by decree of the town councillors. Okay. So also um, we're seeing here inscriptions that are left to particular people and what they had paid for. Okay, Herculaneum. We 
have no evidence so far that reveals there's an amphitheater or an arena in Herculaneum. However, that doesn't necessarily mean the people of Herculaneum had no interest in gladiatorial displays. Okay. All right. So we find there's we find a gladiator helmet in Herculaneum. Have a look at that. How sensational is that? What we also find here, and I'll zoom in, even though we we come back to this ad for later on. This is an ad for a gladiatorial contest, but in the nearby town of Nola. Okay, it's found on the main road of Herculaneum. Okay, um, so it's it's fairly it's likely that people in Herculaneum saw these ads and then they'd go for a bit of a wander to a nearby town to see a gladiatorial display. Okay, could they potentially have gone as far as Pompeii? I think it's fairly likely considering how big the stadium was, but how often they did that, I, I don't know. Okay, um, but also this is an ad here um, for for a gladi for a gladiatorial display will fight at Herculaneum. So it it's, it could have been likely or it could have happened that the gladiators fought in the forum, okay, as opposed to a structure. They fought in the forum at Herculaneum where people kind of gathered around and watched, okay? So, no, we don't have evidence of a, uh amphitheatre at Herculaneum, um, but that doesn't mean that there were not uh, some displays. All right, moving on. House of the Gladiators is an actual house, okay? So I uh, believe they were housed and trained around 15 to 20 gladiators, um, used as a residence in 1st century BC. Uh, so in this would have been uh, in the reigns of Augustus and Claudius. Okay, we've got 100 different pieces of graffiti made by gladiators found on the columns. It gives us a bit of insight into their designations and weapons. Okay, so we've got things like the girl's idol, Celadus, the Thracian gladiator, girl's heartthrob, Thracian gladiator, Celadus, belonging to Octavus, 4313. So there's a couple of interesting points here. Okay, gladiators as well are not a high status, but gladiators could become very, very popular and have their own fan clubs as well. Okay, that's quite interesting. The other thing, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, but belonging to Octavus. So that tells us that gladiators can actually be owned, okay? And probably not just by anyone, but gladiators could actually be owned. So potentially that could mean that there's private gladiator displays um, that could have taken place um, as well. Okay, here we've got the gladiator barracks, and as we, we went over before, we, we learnt that that quad porticus um, that was once the kind of a quadrangle that met, uh, met the small and the large theatre was converted, okay, potentially after the earthquake, um, it, it was uh, turned into a gladiator barracks, okay, and the, the little, the small sections were converted to cells, uh, which, which were once shops. Okay, we also find some like equipment and weapons and stuff in there as well. Okay, so we've got some other evidence here for um, uh, you know gladiatorial displays in the amphitheater. So here we've got this is an artist's impression. Okay, um, on a particular building on the main street of um, uh, you know games that are coming up. Okay, and I might talk about um, the reason for the games, the name of the man paying for them, the time and place, and who's fighting and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so the programmata, um, which is like a public program kind of situation ad, could have been go away. Could have been on on the outside of the facades of the shops and stuff like that on the main street. Okay, um, this is an artist's impression on a particular building um, before the building has been degra has degraded a little bit and suffered from bombing in World War Two. Okay, here's that. Uh, here's the building. Um, this is in Pompeii. Um, obviously, you can see still there's some kind of there's there's some evidence that some of the markings still remained, but compared to now. Um, that's what's left of it, okay? Because unfortunately, um, it wasn't able to escape 
some damage from World War II. All right, here's another picture um, showing that the the sides of the arena um, would have had some really like colorful pictures. Okay, um, this one here, I'm not going to the, read the whole thing, but this is for you to read as well. What it's basically, if you want the main idea of what it's showing you though, is um, it, it's it's showing about the, the 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 guy who it's talking about on the tomb. Um, it's talking about the positions he held, but not only that, um, he, it's talking about the, the, the games and the vast amount of entertainment that was paid for um, during during the lifetime of Aulus. Okay, so um, as you can see here, politics and the throwing of entertainment for the citizens definitely go hand in hand with each other. Okay. All right, this is a very famous fresco here, okay? Um, what What is interesting about this, the fresco is supposedly um, demonstrating how a riot broke out once in the Pompeii amphitheater between Pompeians and visiting Nucerians, okay? So not unlike uh, some Aussies at, uh, well, I mean, I mean, around the world for soccer and stuff like that, I suppose as well, but, um, you know, people don't mind a bit of a biff at a sporting event. Um, and in fact, there was a supposed to be a 10 year ban after, after this riot broke out, but it was eventually lifted by Emperor Nero before the 10 years was up. Anyway, I digress. This is a very famous fresco. Um, the interesting part, the interesting parts about this fresco, um, the up here now we believe or well not believe we know that there was like an awning or a shaded area, um, that could be displayed on, well, not displayed, but thrown out on the amphitheater, which could cover the people on hot days. Um, it was also um, possible that um, water, scented water was sprinkled or onto the people as well to cool them down. Now, I don't know whether the awnings were wet and then the, the you know, the scented water dripped through or it was, I, I don't know how the water was actually delivered to the people underneath, but to be at the event with this on there would have been like a, that would have advertised it as, you know, come down, you're going to, it's going to be a comfortable day, enjoy the games, um, and stuff like that. Valerium, Valerium, is it? Valer Valeria, yeah. Um, and we also here, as I've got a circle around this as well, we could also have stalls outside of the the amphitheater, amphitheater as well. Now, to do this, you would have needed permission, likely from the ediles, who would have oversaw your permission to set up a stall in the amphitheater. Okay, so not too dissimilar to what we see today. Okay, we see little stalls and stuff. Even going into a rugby league match, they're selling jerseys and hats and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we've also got another, um, you know piece of evidence here, I believe it's graffiti as well, so this is on the wall of the Eumachia near the forum, okay, this is, you know, advertising for a gladiatorial troop of Aulus, so that means that this guy owned a few gladiators, okay, so once again, gladiators could be privately owned. All right, um, look, this article here um, is something that was found very, very recently. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to you. And it's not too bad to be updated with the most recent stuff um, that historians have found. Okay. Um, so this is from last year uh, in Region 5. They, they came across a building um, where a painting was discovered inside. And it's not a small painting. You can see it here. Um, it was believed to have been a tavern that gladiators, um, you know, frequent, frequently, frequently went to. Okay. Now we've got two, we've got two gladiators here. Okay. Two different types of gladiators. One of them's winning and the other one appears to be succumbing. Now what you can't see very well is, um, the one that's succumbing appears to have a wound to his arm. So this might be a common kind of wound that occurred with gladiators. Okay, so we've got blood dripping down there. Okay. All right. 
we are now on to the palestra. The palestra is basically a mix between like a gym, a community center, a spa, um, a library, um, a park to train at. Like it's kind of, these things are awesome. Okay. Um, so exercise appears to have been highly valued and there's a lot of borrowing from kind of Greek exercise and sportsmanship and all that kind of stuff for the palestra. Okay. I'm going to quickly just squeeze over this one, the old palestra. Um, it's one of the first ones, um, in an open colonnaded space. So as you can see, colonnaded with our columns surrounding it. Okay. Um, and as you can see as well, um, there's a, commemoration for someone who approved this building as well okay um the great palestra okay near the amphitheater southeast of town okay there's a video here if you wanted to watch that about the great palestra as well um it's it's quite large it's got a swimming pool in the center um toilets are available uh, it's large enough for running discus um all of these kinds of things the other interesting thing as well is we found graffiti at the Great Palestra um, that that gives us an idea that it may have been open to the public. Okay, so we find graffiti there about a teacher kind of advertising their services. We find other graffiti appearing to be written by children demonstrating the education and training that may have occurred there at the time. Okay, um, Emperor Augustus, during his reign, he really encouraged associations of young people um, in like almost youth games. Um, and, and this was an opportunity to instill imperialist propaganda. You know, how good are we? How good are the games that we're putting on and all that? How good are Romans and stuff like that? Or how good are, like, how good are we all, basically? Okay, here's an artist. Um, oh, that's the arena. So our palestra is here. Okay. Um, and here it is. Here's a photo of it here. It's really nice. Okay, so our palestra of Herculaneum. It's in the northeast part of town. We've got a shallow pool in the center. Okay, um, this one's likely not for swimming, but it's more ornamental. But there is another pool in the walkway, which was likely for swimming. Okay, um, financed by Nonius Bulbus. Okay, he pops up again. Now, this is still partially buried, but we've got the knowledge of the tunnels and, but the, the tunnels and stuff that we've kind of navigated give us an idea about the shape. And here are some pictures here. I believe these are photos by Miss Kenna that she um, very nicely sent to me. So um, uh, a crypto porticus is almost like a lookout that you could have stood up there and watched people kind of exercising and competing down below. Um, we believe this table here um, is potentially where the presentation of prizes took place. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. So we've got the pool down below. Um, there's a, there was a cool little fountain here um, with a five-headed serpent, which is you know supposed to be killed by Hercules, their patron, kind of hero of the town. Um, and that was a fountain believed like it, the water would come out of each of the serpent's mouths. Okay, Gam oh, guys, also with the palestra, guys, this is definitely a form of leisure. Um, it's a form of entertainment. Um, you go down with your mates, you have a bit of a wrestle, you have a bit of a, you know, competition, um, and then you could potentially hit the baths after you have a bit of a workout. And some of them, you could sometimes have a palestra and a bathhouse connected to each other or very close to each other. So, um, you know, you go spend some time with your mates, have a muck around, have a bit of an exercise, and then over, over you go to have a relaxing bath, okay? All right, um, gambling. I'm not going to say too much about gambling and drinking because I'm a responsible teacher. Um, so we do have, gam there is definitely some form of, uh, well, there's evidence that gambling was a pastime um, in, in Pompeii and Herculaneum. Even by sheer number of how many taverns are available at both of them gives us an idea that they it, frequenting a, an inn or a tavern must have been popular. Otherwise, there just would not have been so many inns and taverns, okay? 
Um, but we've got some mosaics here about gambling that took place. Um, it could be done on dice games, which we've found evidence of dice. Um, it also could be like cockfighting um, and people bet on gladiatory displays and stuff as well. Okay, so very quickly on drinking. Um, drinking's quite popular as well. Okay, now you might remember this evidence because we talked about the neighbouring town of Nola. Not only is this an ad for a gladiatory display in Nola, but we've got some wine here. Not only wine, but the different types of wine that would be sold and how much they are. Okay, so obviously you probably have some snooty people that got only the most expensive wine and the wine that everyone kind of got. Okay. Um, and here, this is a very famous kind of bar in Pompeii. Um, the, the owner is female, Asalina. Okay, and we've got some, it's famous, it's interesting for a few reasons. We've got some um, political propaganda outside of, of her bar. Um, not only that, we've got some graffiti from inside the bar of customers that owe debts and that kind of stuff. But, guys, females could actually have a business. Okay, that's that's really interesting. So females could actually, whilst they couldn't um, enter into politics at all, they could contribute economically to the town. Okay, and they could own their own business. Okay, she even had a thermopolia here, with, which meant maybe she had some kind of fast food as well for people that visited, okay? So, again, you can connect um, leisure and economics here, or the economy of the towns, even the place of females. All right. Now we are on to bathhouses. Okay, where am I up to? All right. Bathhouses. Um, they're known as thermae. Um, many homes did not have bathrooms, so it was kind of customary to visit bathhouses, okay? And it's not just about coming here. Like, don't think of it as as you would have a bath at home, okay? Um, this, is, this is a social place. You come here maybe with a group of people. You conduct your business here. You come here with mates and just, you know, talk crap and relax. Um, th there's plenty of things that could have operated here. It's suggested that maybe sex workers could have operated here as well. Um, but I, I, I can't say that with certainty. Okay. Um, they would have opened around midday because the morning would have been set heating the floors and the walls. So you set the fires, um, and the, it would have heated underneath and circulated the air through like that. So the floor could probably be quite hot. And if you didn't wear special shoes, your feet could get, you know, quite hurt. Okay. Um, so the, what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with here is a hyper cost. Okay. That was their heated furnaces under the floors and the, in, you know, that circulated the, through the walls and the floors. The hot air, that is. Okay? Um, many bathhouses have separate sections for men and women. They didn't bathe together. Some of them were smaller. Um, and rather than men and women being physically separated, um, they just went at different times. Okay? Um, guys, the idea of the bathhouses, they're generally decorated to convey luxury. Okay? Many had a very marine theme about them as well, but... Like, you, it's supposed to be this kind of luxurious, relaxing, kind of decadent decadent um, kind of uh, environment, okay? And, you know, mosaics, frescoes, sculptures, like, it was quite, it was, it was set up to look quite pretty. Um, very affordable and accessible for all people to go, okay? Some people can obviously go more than others, but this is quite, this is supposed to be quite an accessible form of relaxing hygiene and entertainment um, at the time, okay? Guys, I'm not going to go through everything about the process of bathing. It's in your booklets and stuff as well. Um, but, but you don't have to follow this pattern, but there appears to be a, um, a general um, kind of order in which you went through with your bathing. You know, you'd drop off your clothes and then, you'd, you know, you'd go through each of these sections, Okay. So I'm not going to go through these, um, but yeah, some, something to look over just to understand what, what happened. 
Okay, so our example here from Pompeii is one of the two main baths known as the Stabian Baths. I believe you guys might have gone there on your trip for those that traveled, okay? It's the oldest. It's also the earliest known um, uh, bathhouse that we have, which actually uses that hip the hypercost uh, form of heating, okay? Um, the palestra and the pool are added later, okay? Got some photos here. Okay, this is the thing that was used to um, scrape off dead skin. Um, potentially, you could have done it yourself. Um, also, potentially, there may have been slaves employed at the baths, um, or by you know you just brought your slave along when you bathe, and they scraped it off, um, scraped off your dead skin for you. Um, that is dead set commitment. Okay, so the strigil is what it's known as. Okay, and we've also got some niches here. Um, the apoditerium, which is like the change room, um, where you could have stored your clothes. So um, not very secure lockers that we have these days, but as you can see, the niche is here for storage of clothes. Okay, the forum baths, also in Pompeii, region seven, um, very much using the design of the Stabian baths. We've got sections for men and women as well, okay? Um, there's some really cool things here. Um, up here, you've got grooves in the ce got a curved ceiling, but there's also little mini grooves. What they actually do is, um, when the water, obviously in the room, you've got steam coming up, um, that would obviously make condensation. And then you'd, rather than having annoying little droplets of water dripping on you, the, the water appears to travel up the grooves and channels rather than drips on the bathers. And that's pretty awesome. There's also a base in here for cold water. As you probably have known, you've been in a sauna or something before, it gets really hot. It's really easy to get dehydrated. So you've got some cold water here. Um, whether they're drinking it or just splashing their face with it, I, that is a great question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Okay. Here's a bath here for hot water. Um, it's not a huge bath. Um, but you know, to sit it easily enough to sit in up to your waist, throw your arms over the side. Um, and here's the underfloor heating system as well. Okay. For Herculaneum now, the central baths. Okay. Um, we've got divided sections between women and men. Um, this is on the women's side. Have a look at this. How nice is this? As I said, a very marine theme mosaic on the floor. Okay. And we can also see a palestra here as well. An open air palestra and potentially a ball court. Okay, the suburban baths, very, very well preserved. Okay, it's near what was then the beachfront. It's obviously not now, um, but on it, this would have largely been on literally on the coastline. Okay, um, from a topographic perspective as well, it's it's kind of high. Um, it's, it's very well preserved. Okay. Potentially a gift from Marcus Nonius Bulbus. Okay. Now this one is not segregated. So it is smaller, but men and women would have gone at different times. Okay. I'm almost done on this one, guys. So be patient with me. Um, you've been great so far. There's been no talking today. Um, so we've got some photos here. Oh, I've only got one slide left. And some more photos here. So, um, some interesting parts here. Because of the intense heat in Herculaneum, um, we know that a lot of the wood like carbonized. So we've got an intact door here um, that has been carbonized in the, the pyroclastic surge. Okay. Um, the other, this is also interesting. There's an indentation on the wall from this thing. What they basically think happened is um, the, the, the force was so strong that it has lifted this up, smashed it against the wall and left an indentation there. Okay. Um, so guys, that's it. Um, I will release another, well, I have got another video coming up, which I believe is on housing. So, um, um, we'll have our chat and, um, zoom session soon.